Hi, everyone. This is Jason Briak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following his work for years now. He's a former software entrepreneur. I think he sold his company at the top of the technology market, but we'll have him tell us his background after I do this introduction. He's a hedge fund manager, and he's done podcasts in the past with Chris Martinson over at Peak Prosperity and also Jim Poplava of the Financial Sense News Hour. And he's now the host of the popular Macro Voices podcast, Eric Townsend, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Now, Eric, for our listeners who are not familiar with you like I am, can you uh, please tell our listeners about your background? Sure. I uh, <clears throat> was a software uh, software entrepreneur in the 90s. I ran a company called The Cushing Group. Uh, for anybody who cares, I'm one of the guys who invented something called service-oriented architecture. Um, that... Uh, term wasn't even coined until two or three years after I'd sold the company. And I thought that I wanted to be a venture capitalist yet and got talked out of it and frankly kind of got suckered down the whole private banking Wall Street thing and ended up losing a lot of the wealth that I generated in the software business, kind of being taken by, uh, by Wall Street. We can talk more about that if you want to. And eventually I realized that I needed to reinvent myself as a full-time private investor. That was oh, mid-2000s, 2006 or so. And I did that for a few years, and I'm a big believer in collaboration. So when I was living in Hong Kong full-time, I organized a lunchtime meeting, mostly of small hedge funds, just a trader's meeting, sharing ideas. And it was actually the guys in that group, once they got to know me, they said, you know, Eric, we've met private investors before. They're guys that take their iPhone to the golf course so they can get stock quotes. You sit 14 hours a day in front of nine computer monitors. You're not a private investor. You're doing all the work of running a hedge fund except for calling a lawyer and turning it into a hedge fund. You're crazy not to do that. And I thought about that for a couple of years. And frankly, the reason that I uh, elected not to launch a hedge fund for a long time after getting that advice is just because I think it's kind of a sleazy business. The, the Wall Street uh, ethics are not the same as the software industry. I learned that lesson the hard way. So I wasn't sure I wanted to get involved with it, but eventually did uh, launch a fund in 13. And um, I'm really excited to have just launched the Macro Voices podcast, which we can talk about also if you want. Yeah, that's very interesting about your background and talking about hedge funds. You know, uh, speaking with some of the hedge fund managers, a lot of them all have the same background. They read the same books. You know, they've been to, they go to like the same five or ten Ivy League schools. They uh, they've worked at the same you know a handful of Wall Street investment banks. And uh, I've heard stories of like 25 year old kids who you know graduated top of their class from Harvard Business School, worked one or two years at Goldman Sachs, and they're already managing millions of dollars. And you know they've never even seen the difference between a bull market and a bear market. And, and here they are leveraging trades. They may do really, really well, you know, with trend trading for a year or two, and then things are going to blow up. So uh, <laughs> down the line. So I, I think it's a really interesting perspective you have with your background. Yeah, and it's what you say is absolutely true, and something that's just astonished me. You know, hedge funds basically. What what is a hedge fund? Well, it's a fund that's managed by somebody called a hedge fund manager. What is a hedge fund manager? It's about maybe a couple hundred guys who have really truly demonstrated that they have the ability to consistently beat the market and about nine to 12,000 other guys impersonating the guys on the first list. And it's mostly sales and marketing and nonsense. And there have been uh, high school students that have launched hedge funds. There have been just rich kids that launched hedge funds and had absolutely no background whatsoever, but had the family connections to raise millions of dollars and lost it. And uh, it's a comp mostly unregulated marketplace and crazy stuff happens for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. And I've heard stories from some of my Wall Street friends of hedge fund managers, you know, straight up stealing millions of dollars and, you know, being able to raise more money for more funds and moving, you know, uh, to different countries and stuff. It's, it's definitely a shady business, like you said, and they're taking they're taking what, 2% and then 2% management fee and then 20% of the profits. And a lot of these guys don't even have track records. That's absolutely true. And you know, on the track record point, one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard, there's a guy I can't remember his name. This was several years ago. He got busted for it and exposed. But what he did is he launched two funds simultaneously. One just ridiculous leverage short, one ridiculous leverage long, both trading his own money. Obviously, randomness of the market, one of those two funds is going to blow up and lose everything. The other one is going to be fantastically profitable. He knew that. He designed it that way. He lets one fund blow up. The other one's got a great track record. And he says, look at me. Uh, I want to raise money. L I'm brilliant. Look what I did here. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> well, welcome to dystopia. That's the financial industry nowadays. <laughs> yeah, normally that guy in the past probably would have went to prison for fraud or something like that for lying on in the prospectus or something. Nowadays, the SEC is just going to go after the little guy instead. Well, oh, I'm hmm? sorry. Go ahead. Well, I want to transition now to get your, since you do host the, the Macro Voices podcast, I want to talk about the macro economy. Uh, this, what the central bankers are doing is just frustrating me. I, I'm sure I'm sure you have similar views of the central bankers. Do you think these central bankers in the main economies like Europe, Japan, the US, China, do you think these guys are trapped with their policies? Oh, I absolutely think that they're trapped. And you know, if there's one thing that I've learned over the last several years, it's a huge mistake to let your own ideology about the way things should work interfere with your thinking as an investor. I used to get all excited about Austrian economists and reading books, von Mises, you know, that's really the way I think that the economy truly works. Those views are never going to be respected by central bankers. If you want to understand what the people who are in power are likely to do next, you have to learn how they think. And frankly, the way they think doesn't really register as making a lot of sense for me. But I've learned that, you know, you have to understand the enemy. And that means understanding that they truly believe, you know, it's not market manipulation in their eyes. They believe that it is their... Uh, calling in life what their job is to manage the economy and to try to manage the business cycle. And they've gotten, I think that a lot of people would correctly argue that that is a fool's errand. And uh, it takes a long time. You know, the bigger the ship is, the longer it takes to change course. And when you're talking about the global economy, these central bankers are imposing policies. Basically, we had a problem in 2008 that was caused entirely by too much debt. The solution is much more debt. Obviously, this can't work, but it does band-aid over the problems. You know, if you're a young person who's gone way too far on credit cards, if you can get one more credit card, you can keep the party going for a little bit longer until it eventually all blows up. And I think that's what we're doing is extending and pretending. It's gone on much longer than I thought possible, and I don't know how much longer it can go on, but someday we have to pay the piper here. Yeah, I completely agree. But the timing of this and when things are going to blow up, it's it's basically unpredictable. I mean, I've listened to the smartest people. Uh, I've interviewed them. I've listened to them do interviews on other channels. I've listened to some of your interviews for the research, uh, you know, recently. And I'm sure, you know, these very smart people, they have different timelines. No one knows for sure. Everyone at best, I guess, is an educated guess. And, you know, lots of smart people are going to be proven wrong by how uh, the ability of these people, the central bankers, these central planners to just keep kicking the can down the road one way or another. Well, and it's certainly, you know, they are the government. They can change the rules anytime that they want to. And I think that if there's anything I've learned, it is not to fall victim to the mentality that's, you know, this thing has to blow up. It's surely in the next year or two, it's all going to come crashing down. We don't know that. It's gone on for way longer. And it's not just since 2008. 2008 was a, a major uh, fork in the road, perhaps. But, you know, the crisis before that was the 2000 crisis. That was probably arguably created by too much easy money. Uh, the easy money policies are bound to be to bring our economic system to its demise eventually but we're down this path far enough that there's no room for somebody to be responsible here you know for a while ron paul was saying we've got to reform our ways and get the country out of debt and so forth it's it's too late for that we're at a situation where we're going to continue to muddle along with this money printing and easy money policies and so forth trying to revive the economy and that will have short-term positive effects. They will continue to bail things out, band-aid over our problems in the short term. And that could go on for many years to come. Eventually, there's an epic collapse in our future. And I'm scared, uh, you know, the way that when you get uh, the size of collapse that is, in my opinion, inevitable someday, history teaches us the way that governments avoid letting that happen is world wars. They, they, they find somebody that they can create a scapegoat with, start a war with, and that is a way to actually revive the economic system over time. And I'm afraid that a really bad geopolitical future is an inevitable outcome of the current financial situation. I just don't know how long it's going to take. And if there's anything I've learned, it's not to try to predict how long it takes, because it, it, these things go on longer than anybody thinks possible. Then all of a sudden they fall apart more quickly than anybody thinks possible. When that starts, I have no idea. 
Yeah, I agree. And they can keep kicking the can down the road. The guy on Main Street, though, I mean, he can't be a central banker in the sense that, you know, he can create all the debt he wants and not have repercussions for that. So the guy on Main Street has to be careful with that because there is no bailout coming for most of the people on Main Street. Now, I, I want to ask you, though, about financial repression. That seems to be a common theme among a lot of these central bankers nowadays with negative interest rate policy and things like that. Uh, what exactly is financial repression and how should people protect them, themselves from it? Well, the first part of that is the easy question. The how to protect yourself is a little bit harder. Financial repression just refers to government policies that are designed essentially to punish savers and investors for the sake of bailing out, you know, it's punish the most responsible people in society for the sake of bailing out the least responsible. How can we possibly deal with the problem that's created by all of these people that got in way over their heads buying homes that they couldn't possibly afford because of a combination of control fraud and easy money policy from the Fed. Well, one way that you can solve that problem is to continue to allow them to service those debts by creating ridiculously low interest rates. Now, the, it doesn't come for free. If you've got something that benefits somebody, it has to cost someone else. Low interest rates cost savers and investors, and it's not just fixed income, you know, having CDs or bank accounts that pay interest. The higher the interest rate is, the higher the natural rate of return will be on other investments, whether it be equities or, or what have you. So basically, financial repression is super low interest rates designed to prevent the economy from failing due to the government's failure to, to rein in things like uh, aggressive lending practices. How do you protect yourself from it? It's not easy. I mean, we have a situation where really all assets are uh, not performing from an investment standpoint as well as you might like. You are forced essentially to become a speculator and there's very good longstanding wisdom in investing that says, unless this is something that you're truly going to apply yourself full time to and do nothing other than manage money, you really don't want to be a speculator. You want to be a long term buy and hold investor because trying to move in and out of markets, you know, when you're dabbling in them and you're part time. It just doesn't work. Nobody is ever successful that way. Therefore, if you're not going to be a full-time money manager, you ought to be a buy-and-hold investor. Well, what financial repression does is essentially guarantee a negative real rate of return for long-term buy-and-hold investors. By real rate of return, I mean adjusting it for the effect of inflation. So you essentially don't get to retire. You know, we used to have a social promise, which is, be a responsible person, have some savings, invest them in your 401k. Your 401k manager is essentially organizing a buy and hold investment for you in the stock market. And you can be relatively assured that over a period of decades, although there will be lots of ups and downs in the stock market, by the time your retirement comes, you're going to have enough wealth to comfortably retire. Well, guess what? We've kind of canceled that plan. We've said it's more important. I don't. I shouldn't say we. I know you and I don't think these things. <laughs> but what governments have done is said, look, uh, we need to do something in order to bail out the economy and the situation that was created by all of this, uh, you know, vulture lending practices and so forth that uh, occurred and created the housing practice. And the only way that we can see to do that is to punish savers and investors through financial repression. And it's low interest rates. What's coming soon, I think, to the United States, we've already seen it in Europe, is negative interest rates. And they're literally talking about outlawing cash so that it will be possible to have negative interest rates. And you think about, you know, when I was growing up, I remember everybody in the government, everybody, you know, the banker in the, the local community bank would tell a, a, a young boy growing up, the most important thing for you to understand and learn is responsibility in life. You need to save and invest. Well, now the government's official policy is to punish people who save and invest that they will there are actually politicians that have decreed savers and investors as the enemies that need to be dealt with because we have to encourage people to spend in order to revive the economy and that's basically like telling a kid whatever you do don't have a piggy bank don't save blow every penny that you can possibly make as quickly as you can, spend it recklessly because that helps create employment for other people in the economy. And in a very, very short-sighted, crazy mentality way, there's a certain amount of truth to that. But what we're doing is we're undermining 
the responsibility values of an entire society by trying to encourage consumption. And it is true that if the government did the responsible thing and encouraged savings and investment, which would be the right thing in the long term, it would have a very crippling effect in the short term on the economy because those people that are saving wouldn't be spending and therefore wouldn't be tipping their bartenders and you know buying that extra uh, dessert at the restaurant that helps add to somebody else's profit. So there is truth to it, but it is this incredibly short-sighted mentality that we've fallen into. And the people in charge of the government are basically telling us responsibility is out. Spending beyond your means on borrowed money is in. Start doing it. We need to get credit flowing to revive the economy. Credit was the problem that got us here, but it's true in the very short term. Just as one of the recognized uh, medical remedies for dealing with a heroin addict is to give them more heroin because it will deal with their symptoms. You know, you could do that in a very short term, but it doesn't make any sense in the long term. And we're basically defining it as a long term policy. It's it's absolutely crazy. Yeah, the policies now are totally myopic. To use an economic term, it's purely rent seeking. I see it as a parasite. You know, we uh, we have to let firms that that did uh, bad investments. We have to let them fail, so people who did the right thing at their firms can go buy those assets cheaper. That's how things have worked in the past. You know, even during the 1980s when we had the savings and loan scandal, you know, all the bad assets were put in one specific bank. And then, you know, people went to jail and things like that for committing fraud. And none of that is happening right now. Well, and the worst part about it, you know, what you're talking about, what you're remembering is capitalism, which we don't really have anymore. We have cronyism. And unfortunately, the mainstream populace is getting the idea that capitalism is what failed us and we should move more towards socialism. You look at the rise of Bernie Sanders, who makes absolutely no apology whatsoever about being a socialist. You know, when I was growing up during the Cold War, we were taught that the socialism and communism was the bad guys and that our whole way of life depended on not falling victim to that mentality and thinking that there's a free lunch because there's never a free lunch. And the way you have a powerful, successful country like the United States that I grew up in is free market capitalism that includes failure and bankruptcy when people screw up, as you're describing. What's happened is we've lost that system of capitalism in favor of this crony system where everything is government managed and you know the only way to succeed as an entrepreneur is to know how to play the system and, and deal with regulators and so forth because so much crazy government overhead has been created that gets in the way of starting a small business and being successful as an entrepreneur, which is what grew the country. So what we're dealing with is we've lost capitalism. We need to get it back. But what most people perceive is capitalism is the problem and we need to move away from it in favor of socialism. And it scares the heck out of me in terms of what the next 20, 30, 40 years are going to bring. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, what we have now is definitely not real free market capitalism. You know, maybe for the guy on Main Street who's running a small business and there is no bailout, maybe he's experienced to the some free market capitalism. But, you know, most of the larger firms are spending. I live right outside of Washington, D.C., so I know some lobbyists. So I know how much money is being given to these lobbying firms for the lar by the larger corporations and special interest groups and things like that. What also scares me is, you know, the fact that uh, in Europe and in the United States, we have these guys like Larry Summers who are saying, you know, we need to just eliminate a uh, hundred dollar bills and cash and things like that because, you know, it's promoting people to use credit and credit cards. And so the government can track and tax every transaction, you know, paying all cash for something is a good thing. Then you're not, you're not running up large amounts of debt. I used to think that was, I still think it's a good thing, but you know, the government is just promoting that it's not, it's really scary. Well, you know, and it's, it's amazing the degree of, um, judgment that occurs when the FISA law was passed in 2006. Basically what happened was the government got caught red-handed. There was a secret AT&T uh, closet in San Francisco where the government was monitoring and collecting metadata about everybody's cell phone calls and I think it was actually landline calls too. And uh, this was illegal at the time and the people in the government should have gone to jail for it. Well, what they did is they retroactively passed a law saying it's legal in order to, you know, once it had been exposed, to prevent anyone from being prosecuted. And I was so outraged by that that I, uh, you know, I just thought this business, uh, and I think part of it was financial transactions. The, it was the, the event in San Francisco with the phone is what led to this, but it also, part of the law, made it uh, compulsory or at least legal 
for the credit card companies to turn over all of your credit card transaction details to the government. And I was so offended by this that I said, you know what, it, it, it's, it's my duty as a citizen to stop using credit cards and to transact in cash. So I started getting lots of large ATM withdrawals. I started carrying several hundred dollar bills in my wallet so that I would have enough uh, money to pay for, you know, an expensive dinner or something. Uh, and if you carry hundreds of dollars in cash in your wallet, you are a criminal in the eyes of a police officer. I had a couple of instances, one in a bar in San Francisco, where I, I was reported as suspicious. And this was, uh, you know, early 2000s, 2007 or so, a few years after 9-11. Uh, uh, somebody reported me and the cops showed up and wanted to question me as to why I was carrying so much cash. And I said, because I believe in the rule of law. What, what do you mean? And they wanted to know, well, what's the purpose of it? And I, I said, huh? And the guy was really <laughs> demanding. And he says, you're going to tell me right now what you've got this cash for or you're going to jail. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. It's for three purposes. Uh, I was not trying to, to disagree with you. What are they right now? And he's writing them down. I said, sir, yes, sir. Number one, as a store of value. Number two, as a medium of exchange. Number three, you can guess the rest. I'm using the, the definition of what cash is. He writes yep. them down, takes my driver's license number, and goes away. So I'm being treated as a criminal for transacting in cash because I'm offended by the fact that true criminals in the government broke the law and the Congress responded by retroactively making it legal to do what they did. And I'm the bad guy who's being questioned by the police. So it, it's Orwellian, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And nowadays, if you go to the local bank branch and you try to, you know, you want to put a down payment for a used car or something like that, you know, a large purchase and you want to put down a cash pay down payment on it. If you take out a couple thousand bucks from the local branch manager, they're going to think you're a criminal, too. So they won't even give you the cash without asking what's it for, filling out, you know, all these forms and stuff like it's it's unbelievable now how things how much things have changed. It absolutely is. And, you know, they they're, they require the banks to file something called an SAR, suspicious activity report. Anytime, you know, if, if you are George Soros, you're a billionaire and you take, say, twenty five thousand dollars in cash out of the bank. That's what percentage of, of his net worth, 0. 0.000 something, 1%. Uh, that is a suspicious criminal activity. The police will be called immediately. It, it's just crazy what has happened. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about this a long time. Uh, you know, welcome to Dystopia. We have a Gallows Humor show where we talk about uh, these things and all the Orwellian stuff going on and the corruption and scumbaggery from Congress and corrupt politicians and things. But I want to transition to another topic. Now, you used to do a peak oil uh, articles and podcasts. We've had the shale oil boom. We've had, you know, uh, the rise and fall, I guess, of the shale oil players. Do you think uh, the shale boom and subsequent bust coming up has delayed peak oil a bit? Oh, absolutely. But it is a delay. And the thing that's important to understand is, first of all, I don't really buy into at least one version of the peak oil thesis, which is some people think, you know, we're going to have this huge, crazy societal crisis where everything collapses because we ran out of energy. That, that's nonsense. That's not going to happen. What I talk about is peak cheap oil, which is to say all the cheap and easy stuff has already been found. It, it, the cost of extraction is going to continue to increase and increase exponentially. And that means that the cost of energy as a percentage of the overall economy is going to increase, and that's going to have profound effects. Now, what happened is we've had basically easy money policy from the Fed, quantitative easing, created a tremendous amount of money that had to go someplace. And a lot of it went into the junk bond market to finance shale drillers. And a lot of those projects were not really economic at oil prices below 80 to $100 a barrel. And they were financed anyway. And of course, now a lot of those companies are going bankrupt. So we had, because of reckless monetary policy, too much money chasing not enough good deals. We built too many shale wells too quickly. But if you look at the production decline rates of shale in particular, you know, these wells only last a few years and they're gone. And so we've drilled up the western half of the country like Swiss cheese. We've got all these shale wells that are more than we need right now, but we don't have any plan for how we're going to address the declines that are forecast over the next 10 to 15 years. So peak cheap oil is, is 
as real as it ever was, but it is also absolutely true that if you print trillions of dollars of money out of thin air and, th and a lot of it ends up in malinvestment in the shale patch, you're going to have a temporary supply glut. That's exactly what we've had. It looks like maybe we're coming to the, uh, the perhaps the bottom is in in oil prices and the supply glut is ending, but you know we need to see some significant drawdowns in inventory over the course of the summer because at current inventory levels, we can't tolerate fall maintenance season when the refineries shut down partially in order to reconfigure from summer to winter grades of gasoline that they're producing. We can't get through that without a storage crisis if we were to go into it at current levels. Historically, starting in April and May, you see drawdowns in inventory. We're still seeing increase in inventory. So are we going to have a storage crisis that could actually crash oil prices and cause a lot of economic carnage? I was previously convinced that it was almost inevitable, that it had to happen. It looks like between the problems in Venezuela, Nigeria, the Canadian wildfires are just causing horrific uh, destruction and, and a lot of, uh, of personal stories from some of, of my listeners who, who are up there are uh, just crazy stuff. It, but, you know, it's taken about three and a half, three and three quarters million barrels per day of oil production offline. Now, it looks like, you know, it looked like last week the Canadian wildfires were under control and we're going to be back to normal. This week, it's not back to normal. What's next week going to tell us? I don't know. But if all of these geopolitical situations, if the Venezuelan economic collapse somehow came under control and the militant action in Nigeria came under control and the tensions in Libya came under control and the fires in Canada all got put out, if all those things you know, were to happen, I think we'd again be looking at an inevitable storage crisis. These geopolitical upsets have, I think, saved the day, but I'm not even sure of that yet. Every decade, Eric, it seems, you know, the cost to produce oil, they go up quite a lot. And, you know, new production comes, we've seen this in the 60s and 70s, when a new, uh, new types of production came online, whether it was in North Sea or up in Alaska, and or, a, or offshore drilling in the US uh, in the water, that these things would temporarily slow down the rise in oil prices. There'd be a temporary glut, it would knock the price back down, and then we'd start marching higher again. It seems that shale oil has done this. You know, it's temporarily slowed things down. Uh, and we have people now in Congress, we have congressmen talking about how, you know, the US can become energy independent with all the natural gas produced as a byproduct from shale oil and the cheap shale oil. But people are thinking, you know, that this credit's gonna be easy. We have these oil producers like you said, that basically I read articles on Zero Hedge saying these guys are bankrupt and they're still increasing production. It's just head scratching that they can keep producing like this. None of this seems sustainable to me that these guys are in bankruptcy and, in keep, and can keep increasing oil production. Well, it's definitely something that I've learned the way the mentality of that business works. What, what the oil drillers are in the business of doing is drilling oil wells. They're not in the business of understanding the, the macro economy or what the supply and demand fundamentals are. They're in the business of raising money from Wall Street, mostly through the junk bond market. And if they can get the money, they're going to drill the wells. That's just how it works. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's a good idea to drill wells or not. That decision is made by the financiers, not the E&P companies. That's yeah, that's very interesting. I think long term, though, you know, these these shale oil wells, like you said, with the depletion rates, you know, t a decade from now, all the sweet spots will have been drilled in most of the best U.S. shale oil deposits. And we'll be on to the even more marginal, higher cost ones again. And we'll be back to talking about, you know, 80, 90, 100 dollar oil. And then, you know, more supply will come online and the cycle will repeat again. That's exactly right. Now, I want to transition to what George Soros, Carl Icahn, and Stanley Druckenmiller have been saying about the stock market. You know, these guys, it looks like they're all very heavily short, but why don't you think the stock market has crashed yet in your personal opinion? Well, I am baffled. I, first of all, I would not have expected a crash in the sense of an 87 style thing. I think that, you know, we are in a rate uh, normalization cycle according to the Fed. And I think what's happened is the current generation of traders, people are just so short-sighted that they're, it's not registering. Everybody assumes that what we used to call the Bernanke put is still there. And, you know, if anything goes wrong, don't worry. They'll come to the rescue with more quantitative easing. If you listen to the messaging from the Fed, even this week, Dudley was really clear saying there's too much complacency in Wall Street that we're going to step in to bail out the market. That's not our job. 
I think to some extent he's bluffing. It, he, they think it is their job to bail out the market, which I think is too bad. But we've got so much complacency. When I, I thought that you know we were headed down a few months ago, and that the, you know the the final top was in, and that that was it. It seems now that was you know down to low 1800s. I thought by 1950 or so on the S and P where we hit the 50-day moving average, I thought it was going to roll over there. It was a short squeeze. The market had been a little bit oversold. Okay, so we're in for a bounce. It makes sense. Well, we bounced all the way back almost to all-time highs. And uh, looks like maybe now what we're seeing is a head and shoulders pattern, which would be very bearish. But we tested that neckline on the head and shoulders yesterday on the uh, FOMC minutes release, and nothing really happened. So I, <laughs> and we bounced off of it, and now we're trading much higher. I think this is crazy, but I think that it's going to take a catalyst. And I think that the first catalyst that has to happen might be a rate hike in June. The market will then have a temper tantrum, but I think most traders will have the expectation that, oh, well, as soon as we get to a 10 or 15% sell-off, of course, the Fed's going to step in and bail out the market. I don't know. I think that the, um, the Fed wants to get Wall Street out of that mentality. But when push comes to shove, I think they probably will step in. One of the things I think will be different, especially because of the political cycle, is that there will be very loud cries to say, let's not have another bailout for Wall Street. If we're going to print more money, then let's direct that money at helping the real economy, not Wall Street. And Obviously, there is a lot to be said for that argument because it's a heck of a lot more ethical to bail out hardworking families than it is to bail out Wall Street. But we've got a really big hidden risk here, and that risk is a lot of re people who were against quantitative easing, myself included, predicted it would be extremely inflationary, and the result would be runaway inflation, and that would cause a whole other set of problems for the economy. The reason it wasn't inflationary is because that money didn't, for the most part, go into the hands of hardworking Americans. It went to Wall Street, and they invested it in junk bonds and the shale patch and so forth. That did create some employment, but for the most part, it went into the financial system. And because it was not in the hands of consumers, it didn't cause any inflation. If we were to have another multi-trillion dollar money printing, uh, although I certainly think it would be more ethical to put that money into the hands of the people who need it, putting it in the hands of the people who need it would be extremely inflationary, and it could cause runaway inflation and a whole host of other problems. Yeah, like you said, I agree. A lot of the money did go into asset bubbles. So we had asset bubbles that were reflated. We've had real estate prices in San Francisco go up like crazy again and in so many other states and uh, obviously all over Canada too. In Vancouver and Toronto, the real estate prices have gone crazy as well. Uh, I also think one of the reasons why the stock market hasn't crashed yet, besides the fact that I think there's high frequency trading computers that are you know manipulating the market higher, I also think there's a lot of money that's coming from other countries, maybe China or some other countries that still view the U.S. is safer. Uh, do you think that's uh, since you talk to a lot of foreigners who manage money, do you think they've put a lot of money, moved it out of uh, markets in other countries and moved into the U.S. for safety? Yeah, it's, it's safety, but it's also reaching for yield because of what a lot of them are doing is they're looking at how consistently strong the U.S. dollar index was all through uh, 2014 and most of 2015. And they're saying, boy, if I invest in U.S., I not only get probably the cleanest uh, dirty shirt in a, in a very ugly laundry pile, but I also get the currency appreciation benefit of a strengthening dollar by investing in dollar assets. Martin Armstrong has an interesting theory where he says, look, as ridiculous as it might sound, there's plenty of room for the stock market to double from here, not because the economic fundamentals dictate it, but because the rest of the world is falling apart a lot faster than the U.S. is. You look at the refugee crisis in Europe, the fact that Europe already had a completely unsustainable uh, welfare system, that they're you know, on the edges of their ability to sustain more debt without a sovereign debt crisis, and they've got all this, uh, you know, influx of immigrants that are causing all kinds of social problems, which increases their spending requirements. Europe's not looking pretty. China, Japan, really not looking pretty. Major sources of wealth all around the world. It really it looks like the U.S. is by far the most attractive place. And so you get into what potentially is a self-reinforcing 
I don't, I'm not, not sure if it's really a virtuous cycle. It may be a, a vicious cycle in terms of its ultimate outcome. But what it does is it just encourages more and more capital inflow into the United States. That means buying dollars. That's further strengthening the dollar. That causes more and more investors to jump on the bandwagon. The dollar appreciates. U.S. Uh, you know, asset markets appreciate because there's more and more international capital. Eventually, it all falls apart because it wasn't really being driven by any economic fundamental factor that was sustainable. It was just how bad things are elsewhere. So, you know, what it, that potentially sets up the U.S. markets to go crazy higher from here and then have an absolutely catastrophic blow off top akin to, you know, late 80s, early 90s Japan, where everything just suddenly fell apart. And, um, you know, I don't think that we could sustain that in U.S. markets because it, when it happened in Japan, it was really, really bad news for Japanese citizens. But Japan didn't have the ability to go start a nuclear war to solve the problem that way. Uh, the people that are involved now do have that capability. And if you look at the current presidential candidates, I don't see a lot of pacifists on the list. Yeah, that, that appreciation, that theory of the stock market doubling despite the real economy crumbling, that sounds like von Mises' crack-up boom scenario where the real economy crumbles, but the asset prices go through the roof. And, you know, you, you mentioned examples of the 1987 crash in Japan. I would add in the October 1929 crash in the U.S. because the global economy was not doing well then, but the U.S. economy was doing well, still exporting things. And you had a lot of flight capital come into the U.S. markets then, and that, create, that was one of the things that created the stock market boom in the U.S., besides, you know, buying stocks on margin and things like that in 1929. And you also had excessive credit, at least in the immediately recent history coming up to 1929, particularly in the sense of much lower margin requirements and a lot of speculation in stocks. It's a different kind of credit now. We've got private debt. We've got sovereign debt. We've got debt across the board. But we've got much more credit credit in the system now, and that means more long-term vulnerability. Now, I want to get your technology, your opinion, since you have a technology background on what's coming with robots and automation. We have a lot of younger listeners who are graduating college. They have a couple of degrees. They're looking for work in the economy. Uh, do you think people are going to have to, what types of skills do you think people are going to have to learn then to, you know, avoid being replaced by automation or robots? Well, I think it's a tremendously complex social problem because what we're seeing, and this is a, an ongoing problem that it's not just robots and automation, it was computer technology in general. We're seeing a, an economy that used to be agrarian where anybody who's willing to work hard can get ahead. And basically, you gotta be smart now. The, the people who are the engineers who can design these robot systems so that you don't need any employees in the fast food restaurant anymore, uh, they're doing something good, and it should be encouraged, and we, we want to automate things and make the world a better place, and we want to have automation. But wait a minute. Not everybody is smart enough to go to MIT and learn how to be a, a robot designer. What happens to the masses who are not, you know, whose skills were basically work at the fast food restaurant? What happens to that guy? There's really nothing that's going to be left for him to do. And I think the reason that the middle class has been crumbling for decades in the United States is partly because technology is displacing them. We don't need hard working men to swing hammers and break rock anymore. We need one guy to run some super expensive multi-million dollar you know, hydraulic machine that does that. And soon enough, that guy will be replaced by a robot that can do an even better job. And we don't, you know, it's, it's not productive to try to get in the way of this and say, you know, the people should pass a law against automation because that just makes us uncompetitive against other nations. You want to embrace automation and improve the economy, but you should be improving the economy so that people don't have to work as hard, not so that more people end up displaced and out of work. And we haven't uh, really looked at that as a, as a nation in terms of what do you do about the fact that there's just, you know, not very many jobs anymore except for people who are smart enough to invent things and design things. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm all in favor of efficiency and new technology that can allow people to be more productive and do more with less and things like that. But unfortunately, what I see, I think the problem is government, you know, the people there who would have all this free time, maybe because uh, uh, also their cost would be dropping, too, because with this new technology it would be able to lower costs, it would offset any monetary inflation. But if they were able to start a business, if the regulations and taxes were low enough, they could go and take their free time and learn a new skill and maybe 
combine with a couple friends here or there over the internet and start a business. The, the ability to do that, you know, for people with an online business is easier, but for businesses in so many other industries to start new ideas and things like that, there's so much extra fees and regulations and stuff like that. Uh, you know, since we are building an educational technology company and we're trying to get investors, you know, dealing with the government and trying to get investors from California, there's so many extra fees to add to our LLC in Virginia. So there's so many rules and regulations and hurdles now. Uh, I think originally, you know, the economy, when there was a lot smaller government, they allowed it easier. So if there was a new industry and it replaced jobs, people would have the ability to, you know, start a new industry and the government would, you know, not be in the way, not as many taxes and things like that. Is is that what you also see? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm told, I think it's in Los Angeles, in order to open a dry cleaning business, you need something like 37 different government licenses. It is utterly ridiculous that we have lost sight of the fact that what made America great is the American entrepreneur. The fact that anybody, it doesn't matter whether you're from the right family or have the right connections or went to the right Ivy League school, if you're willing to work hard and you're willing to take personal risk, you can be much more financially successful than your peers just by starting your own business and taking responsibility for creating something that didn't exist before. We've made that next to impossible, and it, in many cases it is intentionally uh, larger companies trying to create barriers of entry to prevent smaller competitors from being able to compete with them have bribed Congress uh, through lobbying efforts, and that's what's happened, and it's, it's really horrible. I think there is a solution, unfortunately, it's a solution that threatens a lot of very powerful people, and the solution that I see is we need to completely and totally replace the university system. All education, higher education, should be online and it should be free. And if there's anything, you know, as much as I'm a, a capitalist and a libertarian and, and not really big on giving away free handouts, giving away education is a special case because what you could do is you could crowdsource the very best courseware. You, you don't worry about what Ivy League professor who's so high and mighty that he thinks he's above speaking to his students has to say. You crowdsource the courseware on the internet. You let smart people come up with courses. You allow people to get degrees. Everything, all your studying could be done online. You would then go to a testing center in order to take your exams so that you can't cheat and have somebody take it for you. You might pay $100. You know, if you want to get your degree, or I should say, if you want to get your education, that's free. If you want to get a degree that proves your education, that's going to cost you two or $3,000 in test fees over the several years that it takes you to earn whatever degree you want. University, that would be a lot cheaper. And yeah, so, that would be a lot cheaper than what we have right now. What university should be is basically a luxury. If you're a rich kid and your parents can afford to spend a quarter million dollars for you to go off to some beautiful campus with, you know, beautiful grass lawns and, and uh, you know, ivy growing on brick walls and so forth, that's wonderful. And you can have that university spoon, <laughs> spoon feed you the information that the poor kids had to pay attention and work hard to learn. But everybody is on a level playing field and everybody can get the equivalent of a Ivy League Harvard degree for a few thousand dollars in testing fees. And it's all online. The only reason that we can't do that right now is the university system is in the way. All the tenured professors would never hear of it. They would say, oh, it's, you know, online learning doesn't count. You need the structure of a university. That's all BS. You could put the entire educational system. And, you know, MIT and Harvard, I think both, have taken some leadership on this, putting some of their best courseware and lectures online for free, giving it to anybody who wants the education. The thing is, you can't get the degree from MIT without actually actually being accepted and going to MIT. You get just get to listen to the lecture. We need to correct this as a society so that anybody who wants an Ivy League degree can get it online, self-study, uh, and have the same opportunity that rich kids get. And right now we don't have that. Rich kids still get a benefit. If mommy and daddy can send you to have this information spoon-fed to you while the poor kids are working a little harder and maybe require a little bit more discipline, fine, you can go and have the luxury of university. But the notion that we only allow people who went to universities that most people could never afford to go to to have the best jobs in society is crazy. It's immoral, and we should fix it.
Yeah, I think the investments into the educational technology, Eric, over the next decade or two, they're going to solve a lot of these problems. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, but there's a lot of people with business models that are, whether it's Coursera and, uh, you know, Udemy and so many others, Wall Street for Main Street, uh, we actually have an educational technology company and we're looking for funding now for with our business model so people can go on a subscription website and learn how to invest in different skills of investing into different asset classes from experts like you and learn Austrian School Economics and learn entrepreneurship all on an affordable way instead of you know people spending forty thousand dollars a year for a mediocre or lower level business school they get the piece of paper and then you know the the <laughs> they can't even get a job anyway even with the piece of paper so I from what I've learned and I've read you know over 400 books on business and I know you're well read I think it's more important than the piece of paper for the most part is the actual skills you get and the actual connections you have and you don't need to pay uh, you know, $40,000 a year or more going to crazy amounts of debt to get those things that you need to be over the long term successful in life in some type of business venture as either an employee, an investor or an entrepreneur. Right. And this problem that needs to be solved in order to bring this all to fruition is we need to change the standards that exist in hiring where people place extraordinary value on both having a degree from a university and a degree from an Ivy League university is oh so important for the snobs on Wall Street. What we already have is the ability for smart people to educate themselves without needing to bother with university. What's missing is the way for those people to evidence, hey, I'm just as smart as the Ivy League kids. I just happen to teach myself. Now, as a former employer, I can tell you I would be much, much more impressed with the guy who did it himself as opposed to the guy whose mummy and daddy sent him to Harvard. But the problem is there's no way for me to figure out whether you're full of crap or not when you tell me you know as much as the Harvard guy does. So we need some objective system to allow people who are either self-educated or online educated or whatever to pass a test and evidence how much they've learned so that employers can see it. And we need to change the way employers look at things. We need to get rid of these standards that an Ivy League school is important and focus on how much you know instead. The only way that's ever going to come about is smart, young, hardworking entrepreneurs like you creating the systems that make it possible. And eventually, despite the best efforts of government and the university system to screw it up, eventually we'll get there. But it's not going to be something that the government leads. It's going to be something that the government obstructs. Amen. Now, I have one final question before I let you go. Uh, you are a hedge fund manager. Our, uh, people who listen to our channel are looking for help investing. You know, you don't have to give away specific companies or anything like that. But where do you see value for investors? Do you think you, that uh, this is going to be a lot more volatility going forward and investors should prepare their portfolios then for more volatility? Or are there any specific you know, uh, countries or specific markets you think are still undervalued at this point? Well, I'm not sure that there's anything... Uh... Certainly, the crude oil story, we may have already seen the bottom, but right now this bounce has gotten ahead of itself. So as we see crude oil prices and energy companies uh, take another wave down, I'm expecting that maybe the bottom is in, but there's still a wave down to, let's say, crude oil prices in the high 30s as opposed to almost 50 as we're speaking today. I think at that point, energy companies become extremely effective, uh, extremely attractive, rather. Uh, so I would be looking there. In general, though, I think the S&P 500 is extremely overvalued, could continue. Uh, trying to short it is definitely professional's work. I would not recommend that a retail investor try to be short the S&P, especially because we've had this, this irrational exuberance that keeps taking it higher despite the fundamentals. Um, I think that you really need to accept that the, for now at least, financial repression is real and the buy and hold model of just buy an index fund and keep it for 20 years and have faith, that's not working. You've got to either put a huge amount of time and energy in learning to be a speculator, or you've got to accept that investment returns are pretty much flat and they're going to stay that way for a while. Yeah, uh, a lot of the people I've spoken with have been looking for returns outside of the conventional market. So they've been looking at rental properties. They've been looking at, you know, making short term commercial business loans and things like that. So people have been looking for ways to make income then outside of the conventional stock markets and bond markets. Yeah, and I think that that's the place to be. And I, I would say always, if there's anything I've learned in life, it is invest in yourself. And, uh, you know, I would be looking at how do you, if you're talking about young people especially, you know, where is your opportunity to be an entrepreneur? And unfortunately, the government is going to be in your way, not helping you. But 
where can you differentiate and find value? And innovation, uh, which young people are usually best at, is what we need right now. So what can you do in terms of an online business? How can you redefine the way that something is done? And I think that the biggest mistake that I see in young entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs is they're, they're looking at the wrong things. They're, they're saying, well, I really like to, you know, run my own business. So let me look at franchises where I can, you know, open a dry cleaning store or something. That's, that's not the right way to look at it, I don't think. You want to look at how can you recognize something where the world just does things inefficiently and there's a better way to do it and you can invent the better mousetrap. That's where real wealth comes from, and it's not just the wealth that you make as an entrepreneur. It's the wealth that you donate to society in terms of making the world a better place by inventing a better way of doing things. Uh, the way that we do things is pretty screwed up right now, and I think that we need young people to take the lead on looking for how to fix it. Yeah, don't a lot of franchises fail anyway? I mean, there's too many franchise fees and rules and regulations, and you can't adapt to your local market and stuff like that. The best entrepreneurs are ones who figure out a large problem in society that people will pay a premium for, either out of convenience. I think the analogy I heard was either, you know, ice cream or, or aspirin. So are you uh, giving something, uh, people something, uh, the customer something that they really like, or are you giving them something that will, like, uh, reduce their headache then? Yeah, I mean, something that they really want or something that they really need. And uh, what I would say to young entrepreneurs is just look at all of the many screwed up ways where, you know, the older generations have gotten, have failed to recognize what technology is capable of. Uh, if if you're a person in your 20s, you probably know everybody over 50 in your life isn't on Twitter and isn't on social media and isn't on a whole bunch of things and doesn't know or care or get it. So what are the things that are just dumb about the way that, uh, I don't know, the, the way that, that, you know, pizza delivery works? Why isn't it all automated through Twitter? You know, you come up with the way to do the the, the Twitter-enabled uh, order your pizza thing. Uh, I don't know exactly what the example is, but figure out how to use your young person's uh, awareness and openness to technology, which is really confounding a lot of older people, and figure out how to build a better mousetrap that makes the world a better place. Well said, Eric. Well, I just want to thank you again for your time. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge, and uh, you know I, I enjoy your work. Uh, if our listeners want to listen to your Macro Voices podcast or any of your other work, how do they do so? Well, Macro Voices is a really uh, cool project we're excited about. It may interest some of your listeners. What uh, Nathan Egger approached me about, it was his idea. He said, we should create the first podcast that's not just another podcast for retail investors. There's so many of them. It's been done very well by you and a lot of other people. We should create the first podcast that specifically targets professional finance, accredited investors, uh, more sophisticated investors who want to talk about multi-leg derivative trades and the types of things that hedge funds trade in and so forth. So it's intended to be a more advanced uh, uh, subject matter. It's probably not for everyone, but for people who are interested in that content, we're at macrovoices.com. We just la launched a few months ago. I also have a personal website at www.erictownsend.com. Got a few videos there with my uh, views on peak cheap oil. The most recent one was from 2014, so we're still a little bit out of date, but my views from that third video are pretty consistent with my current ones. And uh, that's pretty much it. Great. Well, I want to thank you again for your time, and uh, hopefully you'll come back on every couple months now and uh, you know talk about the markets with me. Okay, I'll look forward to it.